there, my name's Mark Thompson and I'll be talking about time-lapse observations from permanent reservoir monitoring at the Snora field. Uh, my presentation will uh, cover the background and some context of uh, the Snora field and PRM. I'll then go through making the business case and uh, give you some insight of whether we've answered the business case or not and then finally some conclusions. And I'll now uh, say something about the Snora license. The field was discovered in 1979, sanctioned in 1988, and production startup was in 1992. As you can see from the map on the right, the Snora field is located west of Bergen in approximately 300 to 300 metres water depth. The reservoir itself consists of sandstones of uh, Lower Jurassic and Triassic age in the Statfjord and uh, Lunda formations. It's a very complex structure with a lot of channels and uh, flow barriers. The reservoir is approximately 2,000 to 2,700 metres deep. The production mechanisms for the field are provided uh, pressure support from water injection and gas injection and alternating water and gas, otherwise known as WAG. The uh, image on the bottom there shows uh, how large the Snora field is. It's uh, a lot of production still left to be maintained and uh, still uh, one of the biggest fields in Norway. So we look at the seismic history for Snora so far. There's been a lot of repeated stream of seismic for 4D seismic, usually every three years. And uh, if you look on the, uh, the picture on the, the bottom there, you'll see that the first seismic was actually in 1983 before production start up. And then uh, the next survey was in 1997, 2001, 2008, and then 2012. You'll also see that uh, between the 1983 survey and the 97 survey, the Snora A platform came online. And then uh, between 97 and 2001, the Snora B platform. Also in uh, 2008, we carried out a, a pilot of permanent reservoir monitoring known as focused seismic monitoring, in which we uh, laid down a seismic cable and uh, looked into the feasibility of permanent reservoir monitoring. The full field uh, layout of receivers happened in 2013 and 2014. It was a, a big engineering project that took two seasons. And on the right hand side, I have a, a layout of that uh, PRM system superimposed over the town of Trondheim where I, I live in Norway. That's uh, 200 square kilometers total, covers the entire town if we were to put PRM over it. It's roughly 20 kilometers from north to south and 10 kilometers from east to west. And since we've uh, put the seismic system down in 2014, we've been acquiring seismic uh, at least once a year and uh, twice a year from ever since uh, onwards since 2014. We actually just look a little bit more at uh, effort on the uh, receiver side, what we actually did. And here I've uh, got uh, some descriptions of Snora and the Grana field. And we also installed permanent reservoir monitoring system at Grana at the same time. But I'll just concentrate on Snora. So there was nearly 500 kilometres of active seismic cable, as I say, covering an area of 200 square kilometres. This represents 58 receiver lines orientated uh, east-west. And uh, the space in between these lines is uh, roughly 400 metres, with 50 metres between each receiver station. So in total, that's 10,000 uh, stations and nearly 40,000 individual channels. And some of the images around the edge there, they cover the, uh, that operation from the cables in the factories uh, where they were manufactured, transportation via um, truck, and then later ship and installation down in the bottom right hand corner there. So a big engineering project that took two years. If I look at the source effort, this time we were wanting to have a source repeatability and seismic on demand. After uh, we'd buried all the seismic sensors, we need to make sure we have the best quality of data on the source site and uh, we needed to do operations twice a year in the spring and in the autumn. So the solution that we went for was a dual seismic source in a container which could be mobilized on a platform supply vessel. And uh, you see the images of that vessel during uh, mobilization and uh, during operations. When the vessel is not being used for seismic, it can be used for normal supply runs to our, our platforms offshore. So we've effectively changed the business case for uh, for seismic operations, made it much, much cheaper and much, much simpler to carry out seismic. So there's some background and context 
I'll say something now about how we made the business case for these PRM investments. Here's uh, some images on the top of the production profiles and injection profiles of uh, some of the wells. And on the bottom are some of the uh, amplitude maps that represent those production profiles. On the left, we see that uh, in some situations we have amplitude dimming from uh, water injection. At other times, we also have a complex amplitude regime when we've had water followed by gas injection. And on the right hand side there, we also see that uh, sometimes we get no response. And this is when the uh, effect of water has uh, cancelled out the effect from gas. So in fact, we actually see nothing, even though a lot might have happened in the reservoir. So this was uh, our main reason for making the business case here, to try and understand this complex production regime and make more sense of it. If we look in a bit more detail of that, to understand this 4D response, we need to look at it both qualitatively and quantitatively. And uh, we need to be able to differentiate between pressure and saturation and between water and gas. And uh, the PRM project has allowed us to em enable this through uh, improved data quality in that the receivers don't move anymore and the source vessel has very high repeatability. And then we can now shoot seismic twice a year instead of every three years. We can now acquire data on the same schedule that the water alternate, alternated gas happens with these injectors. So this is, uh, as I say, the, the business case for PRM in a very simplified manner. If you actually look at what we do with this uh, business case on a bit more, bit more detailed scale, uh, we're allowed to impact well planning, identify well interventions, production optimization and uh, injection optimization. The data also goes into updating uh, models, both geology models and or geo models and uh, reservoir models. And it's allowed us to update the drainage strategy. And we actually look to see what it is that we impact with that. We have reduced uncertainties. We have much better understanding of risk and its evaluation. And we're able to impact decisions much more effectively and much more quickly leading to accelerated production and ultimately to save costs. And on the bottom there, you see a, a geomodel representation of the subsurface with a, an injector and a producer with multiple reservoir levels. And on the right, you have a, the seismic that rep represents that model and a, a very complicated seismic regime, as I said earlier. So this is what we've been working with to, to try and solve. So the question is, did this actually work? We've made the business case. Did we actually answer the business case? So I'll now show some results from this. So firstly, uh, a little bit about the seismic operations. When we first started, the aim was to shoot seismic twice a year, but we'd never actually shot seismic twice a year. So could we actually do this operationally? As I said earlier, the receiver area was uh, roughly 200 square kilometers. Well, now the source area is uh, over 400 square kilometres. And in terms of active source sail lines sailed, there's over 4,000 kilometres of seismic that has to be shot twice a year. And uh, on the right hand side, you see some uh, images from those operations. The spring operation on the top right hand side and the an autumn operation in the, the bottom right hand side. So as I say, we try and shoot seismic twice a year in the spring and in the autumn. And this is to ensure, and to ensure that we have a big enough difference between surveys that we have 4D effects that we can see. And then we have the winter where we can't actually do much seismic because the weather is uh, mainly too bad. So we managed to shoot seismic twice a year. And if we actually look at the quality of this data in terms of uh, repeatability of source uh, position, a well-known metric within 4D seismic, the inline positioning of the source at, the, at uh, this stage of the survey or project. 99% of the data was within uh, two meters of a pre-plot and 95% of the data in the cross-line sense was within nine meters, which is uh, actually world-class if you compare that with most uh, 4D seismic. And we managed to do this twice a year in both autumn and uh, spring. If we actually start looking at the seismic we're generating. I have some images here. The left-hand side is a, a migrated stack from uh, 2004, and uh, we can nicely see the, uh, the reservoir towards the bottom of that image. 
and in the middle is a, a 4D section or a 4D difference section between two streamer surveys, one in 2009 and one in 2012. And you can see we have some uh, 4D uh, differences showing up there at reservoir level. And on the right hand side, there's a, a 4D difference stack between spring 2014 and autumn 2014. And as you can see, there's a lot less ringing and a lot much better data quality and some very clear 4D effects to be seen there than if you compare the 2009 and 2012 streamer survey as a comparison. So we were very, very happy when we saw that we actually achieved our objectives for data quality and our ability to monitor 4D effects on a much shorter time scale. If we just start looking at some metrics of this, on the left hand side, we have uh, NRMS maps from a streamer survey between 2009 and 2012. And uh, we have some windows for RMS between 800 and 2000 milliseconds in the top and 2200 and to 3600 milliseconds on the bottom. Left hand side is streamer, right hand side is uh, PRM. So we had a goal that we would be able to reduce NRMS between streamer and PRM by 40% and we more than achieved that. Previously we'd had NRMS of between 10 and 20%. Now we're getting NRMS of below uh, 10%. So we were very, very happy with this result. It goes to show that we actually achieved what we hoped with uh, reducing NRMS. So we achieved that part of the business case as well. If we actually look a bit more detail in this, there's a 4D section on the top there between the streamer 2009 and 2012 and the PRM spring 2014, autumn 2014. So we have three years on the top and uh, less than six months in the bottom there. And uh, even though the streamer survey was very, very good in terms of 4D and repeatability, and we can clearly see 4D effects there. With three years of uh, effect in between the, uh, the surveys, it was very, very hard to actually try and understand what it was we were seeing in terms of pressure, saturation, gas and water. It was in the bottom image there, but with, uh, between the spring and the autumn of the same year, we have very clearly defined 4D effects that are very, very simple to understand. So we were again very happy. It made this data much easier to work with. And uh, if we take that uh, context a little bit further, and start comparing uh, between uh, spring, autumn, and autumn and spring, and spring and spring. So left hand side there is a difference map at reservoir level between spring 2014 and autumn 2014. And there you can see uh, an amplitude uh, increase shown in red. If you go, just go forward six months, and now we're looking at a autumn 2014 and a spring 2015. And now we're getting an amplitude decrease highlighted in blue. And as you can see, they look roughly the same in aerial extent, but they have a, an opposite uh, effect. And if you actually look at the data between spring 2014 and spring 2015, we're now one year between surveys, and those two effects now cancel out. So if we'd been shooting streamer seismic on a much broader uh, time scale, we would not have seen these effects. So our ability to pick up small effects over short time scales was a clearly proven during this uh, project. So if we look at a bit more detail of what we're seeing with the, uh, press, these amplitude changes on the seismic. So on the right hand side, I have the, the same seismic uh, maps that I showed before. I have uh, the, the six months difference between the, the first, second survey, second and third. And then again, on the right hand side, a, a 12 month difference between the, the first and the third survey where the uh, increasing and decreasing effects had cancelled each other out. So if we actually look at uh, the injection profiles of the injector A there, we can see that during the first two surveys, highlighted in the vertical stripes, we were doing uh, water injection in that well. And if you look at the, the third survey in the, the last vertical stripe, we'd gone over to gas injection. So we could tie the seismic in with what was happening uh, in that well and in the injection regime. And then in the bottom left hand side, there's a, a map that, or a, a plot that shows the pressure profile of this injector. So the vertical stripe to the second vertical stripe, 
first survey to second survey, we can see that we've had a, a massive pressure increase during that time. And then from the second survey to the third survey, we've had a pressure decrease. So if you take the, the injection knowledge that we have and the pressure knowledge that we have, it allows us to interpret the seismic that we've got and what we're seeing. So between the first and second survey, this amplitude brightening, we can easily uh, interpret that as a pressure increase. Of between the second and the third survey, we can easily uh, interpret that as an uh, amplitude dimming is due to a pressure decrease. The reservoir going back to the pressure regime it had prior to the, the survey. And uh, which means that between the first and the th second th survey, where we didn't see any effects, there was no change in the pressure regime. So we take this a, a little bit further and see what we're, how we've been uh, interpreting it further. So we have this big effect that we can see by the pressure increase. What we did see in the first, between the second and third survey, that the, the pressure increase was towards the south. had gone across a fault that we previously thought was a, a ceiling fault, but had actually stopped some point further south there. There was some discussion at the time whether there was a new ceiling fault there we hadn't managed to uh, interpret or image, or whether it was just that if we waited a bit longer, the uh, pressure field would have gone further south. But when you look at the next survey, which was between two and three, though with an amplitude decrease, we do see that the aerial extent is the same as the previous pressure increase even down to the southern extent of where we see that 4D effect. We've now interpreted that to mean that uh, there was a ceiling fault that was possibly sub seismic that we haven't been able to uh, interpret before. So now we've been using the seismic to, or the 4D seismic to carry out uh, structural interpretation. What this means practically is that we've had to go in and update the GEO model. It allows us to go in and update local reserve calculations in the individual fault blocks that we've got. And once you've done that, you can actually then go back and reevaluate any planned new wells in those facilities. And uh, it allows you to, to validate concepts for any new wells that you would have in these block areas. And it also allows us to evaluate the drilling schedule. The well that we would have drilled somewhere near here is now uh, down prioritized while other wells that have a higher MPV will be, uh, uh, have an increase in priority. So this is how we actually uh, work with the data and uh, apply it to business value. So here I have another example showing the importance of timing of our seismic surveys. They uh, have some seismic uh, 4D difference on the top hand left there. And this is representing uh, an injector and a producer and uh, the impact that the injector has had on the producer. And on the bottom there, a plot of the uh, pressure profile of that injector. Highlighted on the bottom uh, plot there is the timing of the spring survey in 2015 and the uh, autumn survey 2015. As you can clearly see, there's been a pressure increase between the two surveys and uh, a very clear 4D effect on that top left-hand image there. So when we've come to interpret this, we can uh, see that there's been a a very strong 4D response and it's migrated from the injector in the north to the producer in the south. We can see that the faults around there are clearly sealing and more importantly because we have a pressure measurement we can actually calibrate the 4D seismic here and see that this response actually re represents a 40 bar increase in pressure. This knowledge has been used to input uh, as input to petroelastic modeling which we use to calibrate and uh, create synthetic gathers and these gathers are then used to uh, calibrate and use as input to the reservoir or the simulation model allows us to to update the reservoir model for this area and uh, it also allows us to validate the well zone control we have smart well solutions here and uh, we can see whether these are, are working or not and this would indicate that that uh, smart completion is working very well so I've uh, covered so far background and context, told you a bit about the, the size and dimensions of this survey or this work. I've explained a bit the business case and I've shown some examples where we've uh, actually answered the business case and now I'll finally come to some conclusions. So firstly, PRM is actually operational at Snora. As I say, we, uh, we didn't know whether we could actually shoot seism seismic twice a year, but we could. 
And uh, at the time of the video, of the making of this video, we'd acquired five surveys. The NRMS is 40% or more lower than the previous streamer surveys, so we were very happy with that. And we have frequent 4D observations, which have uh, been used for reservoir management actively. So as far as we're concerned, PRM does answer the business case for frequent reservoir monitoring. And then uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the Snorra license and the license partners and everybody else who's uh, made PRM possible at Snorra. It was a cast of thousands and we couldn't have done this without them. And then finally, if you've enjoyed my uh, lecture, you'll find more e-lectures on the EAG YouTube channel. Thank you.